entry, catch Scarlet Queen, Philip Carney, master. Position, 123 degrees, 12 minutes west, 38 degrees, 15 minutes north. Gyro compass course, 168. Wind fresh, sky fair. Remarks, departed Tianjin, China, 2.30 a.m. Sailing delayed 12 hours due to imprisonment of officers and crew. Reason for imprisonment, the white cargo act and our sin. After a searing sunrise that I noticed the water over the side losing its clearness as it filled with the yellow mud of the Hunho River, sweeping out from the troubled valleys of Inner Mongolia. The Scarlet Queen limped into the current under power again, rudderless, bullet scarred, and carrying in her hold ten thousand dollars worth of gin seng roots, the cargo that had been the cause of all her wounds. I had my personal troubles too, based on the same thing. Two passengers. One wrapped in sailcloth, dead from a bullet through his brain, the other, the woman who'd killed him. As we passed over the bar at Taku and swung up the Hun Ho toward Tian Sin, the stream was jammed from bank to bank with the traffic of Chinese rivers, junks, barges, and refuse. Curious, dark eyes swept us as we passed. Naked girl babies were held up to us for sale, and jabbered curses were thrown when we shook our heads, and we inched up against the wash and flow of China. slow, limping progress through the rabble of river craft, the queen did her best to live up to her name. The scarlet figure under her bowsprit swung haughtily across the stern of a fish barge. A swell lifted her nose as she turned disdainfully away from it. But after she was secured to a dock, she seemed to lean wearily against the rope fenders we hung over the side for her. The crew was tired, too. The way I felt that cargo of Jim Sang wasn't worth $10,000, pesos, or glass beads. All I wanted was to get rid of it and everything that went with it, and sleep for about 72 hours. But that particular Tiantian day wasn't cut out for rest. A squad of Chinese military police marched around the corner of a building and was shouted to a halt in the dock. A stocky, bullet-headed Chinese colonel, dripping with gold braid, pounded up the gangway and came aboard. You must have this ship. Yeah, but I don't deserve the honor guard. What's it for? You will speak only in answer to my question. You, your first officer, and your crew are under military arrest. And so Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tolman, and starring Elliot Lewis. The Scarlet Queen, proudest ship to plow the seas, bound for uncharted adventure. Every week, a complete entry in the log. And every week, a league further in the strange voyage of the Scarlet Queen. In two minutes flat, Chinese sentries were stationed at the wheel, the hawsers, and pacing the dock with rifles and fixed bayonets. Two of them prodded Gallagher and me into the cabin. And the colonel, slapping the palm of his hand with a riding crop for emphasis, went to work on it. Your registry. The Scarlet Queen, San Francisco, California, USA. Your destination. Look, Colonel, what is all this? Your destination. No set destination. It's an island trading voyage. Your cargo. General trading cargo. Your cargo. Ginseng roots, number two hold. I will see Bill of Lading. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. This paper, no good. Five by that woman. You know the answers to all these questions. Why don't you come to the point? You carry passenger? Yeah, one. Two. You will leave just them with two. When they're dead, they aren't passengers. They're cargo. I will see dead one. Where is it? Gallagher? Hmm? Go get him. Bring him here. Hey, wait a minute. I'm no morgue attendant. Let him carry his own stiff. Go get him, Red. Okay, Skipper. That's your order, huh? Yeah, you fathead. That's my order. Get out of here. Shove off. Where is woman passenger? Uh, in the cabin across the companion. You are welcome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> She's in there. No! Leave me alone! What mother? She's sick? Fever? Yeah, smallpox. She's 
Don't want to go in? Well, you're so lost. Screaming was natural enough, but the rest wasn't. Her clothes were torn, her face was scratched. She was cowering in a corner, and the look of horror on her face was directed toward me. She dragged herself across the cabin floor like a second road company of white cargo and clutched imploringly at the colonel's free hand. Her act was so bad that it was funny, but the colonel had never seen white cargo. Please, you're a good and kind man. You're not letting him hurt me anymore. He killed my husband. He stole everything we had in the world, our ginseng. Now he tortures me to sign a ransom note. Very sad American woman. Oh, yeah. Very sad American woman. Saddest I ever saw. No, we'll not talk. Sit down to pick. Okay, you've got the guns, but she's making a fool out of you. Are you a coolie? Does the woman rule your house? It's silent. <laughs> Poor sad American lady. Do not kneel before humble Chinese. You are strong enough to stand on feet, poor sad American lady. Yes. Yes, you've given me courage. I lean on your splendid strength, my colonel. I will gladly save life of poor sad American lady molested in my city by her unworthy countrymen. So forced to turn to a Chinese officer for chivalrous aid. For as many years as I have before me, I will thank you 10,000 times each minute. I am unworthy. One thank will be sufficient in this manner. You come to my headquarters. The summoning scribe of English language newspaper China tell Hall's hot story of chivalrous aid. It is as nothing. You will gain the military promotion you so richly deserve. I have powerful friends in Nanking. You have powerful cargo here, Tianjin. Ten thousand dollars for a third American lady. Your greed is as great as your chivalry. It's uh, matched only by your thanks. <laughs> 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 the funny sad lady. <laughs> I love too, Captain Carney. Yeah, how about laughing some of these guns off my ship? Oh, no. I not laugh loud enough for that. I laugh because gold and thanks of poor, sad American lady will buy many bowls of rice for empty bellies in my village. I laugh because it costs so little. Only two lives. Yours, Captain Carney. Your first officer. Mm. You make good sense up to a point, Colonel, but you're taking a pretty long chance executing a couple of American nationals. We are only honoring requests from your own people in Korea to hold you for extradition because of dead woman in Jinsen. You will be shot while trying to escape. Bodyguards hustled my seamen and me across the gangway and into a lend lease ambulance fitted out with bars. The storm broke over Kim Sin. I took a long, last look at the queen as we pulled out. A sudden squall swept down the river and across her bow. She shivered a little, tugged at her moorings. No one has ever really been in jail until they've made the Chinese variety. Alcatraz is a Sunday school summer camp in comparison to Tientsin's. The place is sewerless, and the wind moving heavily in from the dumping ground near the river never lets you forget it. I hope my crew was faring better than I was. I was shoved into a cell that had been died in more than once, and left to examine what I could see of my future, which wasn't much. I was pinning all my hopes on one possibility that Gallagher had caught my cue to shove off and had gone over the side into the river when he left the cabin. I finally gave up worrying about it and stretched out on a stinking, wreck-chewed reed mat in the corner of my cell and fell asleep. When I woke up, I didn't know whether it was day or night, and I didn't care. Day or night, the place would smell the same. Then I heard the door at the end of the long corridor close. Something that sounded like a woman's footsteps. As they drew nearer, I heard the rustle of heavy silk. A strong odor of jasmine crept into my cell. As the key turned in the lock, I braced myself for Alice, probably playing the part of the dragon lady. The door swung open. The first thing that came in was a blast of perfume that lifted me to my feet. Then a small, flickering lantern held aloft by a delicately dimpled hand. The brocade-wrapped mountain of flesh behind it had a face with small, childlike features that were almost lost in the billowing fat that surrounded them. 
He looked Chinese, but he sounded like Charles Lawton. Well, now that I've seen you, I don't wonder that she's half out of her mind. Who are you, Stinky? Yes, how true. I always put on an extra dash of scent when my business brings me into this foul penal institution, which is rather oftener than I would care to admit. Hmm? What are you, the little bail bond broker or something? Among other things, yes. In this instance, as you see, I am carrying a lantern. Like Diogenes, I am looking for an honest man. And you know why? Tell me anyway. Because, quite frankly, sir, I myself am a most untrustworthy person. I advise you to remember that in our future dealings. We do have dealings, is that right? We do indeed, sir, but I suggest we discuss them in more pleasant surroundings. By the way, did I tell you my name? Ah, Sin. I believe it has quite another meaning in English. Shall we go, sir? <laughs> I followed him up the long corridor, reeling in the backwash of jasmine that swirled out in his wake. The door of the cell block swung open, and he trotted out through the jailer's office, nodding benevolently at the guard, who bowed from the waist and accepted the lantern from the dimpled hand. We jogged on out to the street without slackening pace. A mob of beggars raised a clamor as our sin appeared. He pulled from his robe a huge silk purse hanging at his waist and reached into it. Still on the run, he flooded his hands in and out of the purse, and a continuous shower of small brass coins fell into the street on either side of us. The crowd parted like the Red Sea, and I saw the finishing touch. A Rolls-Royce town car waited at the curb. After you, sir. Yeah, thanks. supposed to do now? Ask you where we're going? Well, my dear fellow, you are at liberty to go any place you like. Well, then I'd like to get back to my ship. Very well. If you can find it. What do you mean? What happened to it? I've had it moved. Hey, wait a minute. Who told you you could move my ship? Now, please, sir, don't excite yourself. Your ship is quite safe. Yeah, I'll believe that when I'm on her decks and out of here. You will be. One way or another. Now you said something over that colonel's dead body. And maybe yours, too. Well, we must all die sometime. But how appropriate that you should mention the colonel. He met with an unfortunate accident an hour ago. He fell down and cut his throat. Outside Tianjin, the limousine turned away from the river and climbed into the hills. We rolled through the gates of a high-walled estate and stopped in front of a pink stucco western-style mansion. Inside, we dog-trotted through a series of huge rooms and into a small, chromium-fitted bar overlooking Ah Sin's terrace Chinese gardens and the city and the rising Hun Ho far below. I didn't waste any time on the view. Alice was sitting on one end of a couch, and sprawled out on the rest of it was a sandy-haired white man. He was cleaning a frontier model coat. Well, I see you didn't have no trouble rounding him up, Ah Sin. Phil, Phil, darling... Thank heaven you're all right. Well, if it isn't the poor, sad American lady. Where'd you find her, Austin? I would say she's quite easy to find, wouldn't you? And this gentleman is my confidential secretary, Mr. Mangan. Howdy, Kevin. Yeah, all right. We're all here. Let's have it, huh, Austin? Oh, yes, indeed. Alice, would you make your friend comfortable? Such a most Ricky splash. Never mind the splash. Bring the bottle. Well, sir, as you say, here it is. I am a merchant. Mm -hmm. I deal in a little bit of everything. A jack of all trades, you might say. Plantations in the islands, curling, trade in general. I find it worthwhile to keep tabs on my competitors. Mm -hmm. While doing so yesterday, I intercepted a cable addressed to Mr. Kang of Shanghai and signed by your chief officer, Mr. Gallagher. Uh -huh. You're quite an operator. <laughs> Thank you. To continue. Oh, for you too. I happen to know that Mr. Kang is a very penurious man. Since Mr. Gallagher demanded not requested assistance from him, I assume that you are in a position to put him in the way of a rather handsome profit. Uh -huh. I thereby took immediate steps to obtain your release from prison. I did not know then the true nature of your enterprise. I don't get that. You will. Because, you see, quite by coincidence, this lovely young lady approached my confidential secretary, and so impressed was he by what she had to tell him that he brought her directly to me. Uh -huh. She advises us that the voyage of your Scarlet Queen is being financed by Kang and company to recover a treasure of very considerable value. Really? What was the figure, Mangan? Ten million bucks. 
and you can take off that poker face, Connie. We ain't trying to horn in on you. Our sin's got a real business proposition. You just listen at it. <laughs> Very concisely put, Mr. Mangan. To continue. Yes. I am also aware that a new syndicate, headed by a Portuguese gentleman, Mr. Constantino, is interested. I have contacted both Mr. Kang and Mr. Constantino and have received their replies. To wit, Mr. Kang offers $5,000 ransom for you and will reimburse me for the expenses involved of getting rid of that troublesome colonel. Mm -hmm. Mr. Constantino, on the other hand, has offered me $10,000 cash to release you into the custody of one of his <laughs> uh, agents. So, here you find me on the horns of a dilemma. 10000 against 5000 What are you waiting for? Well, sir, there is still another possibility. Huh? If you and I were to go in together on a full partnership basis, I remind you, forgetting both Mr. Kang and Mr. Constantino... <sighs> well, Mr. Carney... I'll make it easy for you, Arsene. The answer is no. Why? Because there's something wrong with your story. Alice here never knew anything about the voyage of the Scarlet Queen until one of you told her. Well... What about it, Mangan? He's bluffing. Yes, of course. Uh, is that right, Mr. Carney? I'm not bluffing. Alan? He's not being truthful. He made violent love to me on his ship. He told me everything. He did, eh? Well, Mr. Carney, majority rule. Don't rush him off, then. He'll come around. Let him sleep on. Whatever you say, Mr. Mangan. The servant will show you to your room, Mr. Carney. I followed the silent poker face boy out of the room and up to the second floor. He unlocked the door of the room and padded back down the hall without opening it, as if he was scared of something inside. I opened the door, saw what it was. The room looked like a typhoon had hit it. Every stick of furniture was broken, and the floor was strewn with fragments of crockery. In the middle of the mess with a bedpost clutched in his hand like a club stood my chief mate, Red Gallagher. Oh. Oh, it's you, Skipper. I was expecting that hunk of perfume blubber that had me locked in here. How'd you find me? I didn't find you, Red. I was brought here myself. Did they tell you I was here? No. Well, they told me you were. That's why I came. Oh, I'm here now. That out. What? What? Yeah, I'm a lot of help. Now we're both locked. Go on. Break up some furniture, Skipper. It'll make you feel better. I was saving a couple of tables, but go ahead. You can have them. I didn't get to the furniture breaking stage for a couple of hours. Then Gallagher took one of the tables and I took the other. Then we pulled the mattress out from under the pile of lumber in the middle of the room and stretched out on it. It was better than the Tiansin jail, a lot better. I went right to sleep. When I woke up this time, I knew it was after dark. I could see stars through the window grill. But except for that, I might have been back on the reed map in my jail cell. The footsteps were the same. As they came closer, the rustle of silk, the smell of perfume. This time I was ready for us, and behind the door was Gallagher's club. No, don't! Okay, okay, calm down. I thought you were somebody else. And you mean you aren't angry with me? No, I mean I can't knock your brains out because you haven't got it. Listen, my darling, I know a way out of here. Yeah, and to what this time? Please, you must believe me. I had to act the way I did. Don't you see how it's worked out? Yeah, you're a great little politician, gorgeous. You stand on your record. You really do. Look, I came here to sell the gym things so I could get you out of jail. But Mangan had this plan. He works for Constantino on the side, but Austin doesn't know it. What? He said if I'd tell that story about the treasure to Austin, he promised he'd get you out of jail. I don't know why it worked, but it did. It doesn't make any sense, does it? It's the first thing I've heard you say that does make sense. <sighs> Darling, we haven't got much time. I found out where the Scarlet Queen is and the repairs are all done. Oh? Our sin smoked three pipes after dinner, so we won't have to worry about him. Mangan is out and won't be back until after midnight. And I've bribed the chauffeur to drive us into town. The car's waiting now. Where's Red? He's asleep. I'll wake him. I'm yes. awake, Skipper. I've been listening to that yawn, too. You believe her? No, do you? No, but it's a way out. I think we should take... No. But well, let's go. Please, Phil, I mean it. 
Don't open that door. Get away from me. No! No, don't go!
Dixon, and we're all aboard, smelling faintly of jasmine and shell. Without even waiting for dawn, we cast off from the dock and swung out into the sullen current of the Han Ho. The eastern sky had brightened slightly by the time we crossed the Taku Bar, the tops of the swells were shining in the faint light as we moved out into the yellow sea. Then the sunrise and the first morning westerly came at the same time, and I cut the motor. Mainsail and mizzen reefed. Ship secure for night. 